It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. The Seven Spirits of God. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are continuing our study of the church at Sardis. And um, honestly, it, reading this letter makes me sad. Because it, well, the reason it does is because you and I have been in so many churches that are like this. They, they do good works, but spiritually they are dead. Mm. They don't seem to understand what the Holy Spirit's mission is. They don't seem to understand anything about the Holy Spirit. In fact, they sort of look at you funny if you even mention it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why the church of Sardis, for those who uh, believe that the seven churches in Revelation model the the ages of church history, uh, and uh, Sardis representing the uh, age from Martin Luther in 1517 through, uh, say, 1648 or thereabouts, when mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the revival, the yeah. great revivals began, uh, represented a church that was, that was dead, that they thought they were alive, but they'd been so compromised that they didn't even realize, they didn't even know that they weren't alive. There were a few who still were you know, active and, mm -hmm. and keeping the flame alive. But for the most part, the church itself was spiritually dead. And they're very literally resting on their laurels because they are looking back at what they did originally and somehow relying upon that to, to maintain their connection to the Lord. But they have lost the connection because it's the Holy Spirit that continues to connect us right. and, and make us alive. They're very literally dead. Yes, yes. And it, you're right, that is sad. And Jesus, and the title that he chose for himself in the letter to Sardis, really makes it clear that he is part of that. I mean, he, he and the Father and the Spirit are one. Mm -hmm. um, you, you cannot separate them out. Again, the doctrine of the Trinity, not explicit, but implicit mm -hmm. in, in this uh, verse one of Revelation three, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And that's something we touched on last week and wanted to pick up because it's really a fascinating descriptor, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And the seven stars, that means he's holding the seven churches mm -hmm. along with the angels of those churches. And by that, we mean a spiritual being. Um, to me, that's a great comfort, because later on in this letter, he, the Lord says to the remnant, if you will wake up and, and, you know, look, turn to me again and rely upon me again and be enlivened once again, your, your garments will be white mm -hmm. and you will, I will never, ever. The Greek is very clear. It is a very, uh, it's a very strong, I will never, ever, ever blot your name from the book of life. He's holding that church in his hand. That means he's, he's hanging on to them. Mm -hmm. Remember in his prayer, I have kept all of them that you have given me. Mm -hmm. his, his wonderful priestly prayer there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he goes to the Lord and he prays for us. He prays even for you know, those of us who have never been born. He was praying for you and me. He was praying for you. Um, he says that I have kept them all except for the son of perdition. Yeah. And because of that, he's going to hang on to us. I'm a believer in eternal security. If you genuinely have the Lord in your heart, if he is covering you with his blood, if the Holy Spirit is part of your life, and that's the definition, mm -hmm. then he hangs on to you. We are in his hand. Isn't that wonderful? It is. It is. Um, it's almost incomprehensible. Because yeah. I know that there are people who have outwardly 
And, and there have been some very high-profile cases this past year with um, uh, big-name pastors, very popular Christian musicians who have um, publicly rejected the faith. So the question is, were they not truly saved before and rejected? And so yeah, I know that this is a question that isn't resolved, the eternal yeah. security question. I, I agree with Sharon on this. I do believe that uh, if you genuinely are saved, you don't have to worry anymore. You are not... What's the, the joke that you <laughs> used to say? My name is written down in pencil. Yeah, no, our names are written in pen in the book of exactly. life. Exactly. Indelible ink, not pencil. So th this is the uh, parable of uh, the sower who sows in um, you know, thin soil where, they never, where the uh, seeds never really take root. Exactly. And those who publicly reject the faith after outwardly professing to be of the faith really weren't saved before, I believe. But well, it reminds me of the parable of the ten virgins. All ten of them fell asleep. Mm -hmm. All ten. Right. And when they finally awoke, they heard the bridegroom's voice. Remember that thief coming in the night? It's mm -hmm. in this letter. They hear him. Five of them are ready. Five of them have panicked because their oil has run out. It was like they had very shallow roots. They no longer have the Holy Spirit with them. Mm -hmm. They've lost it. And so they are told by the five faithful virgins who have plenty, well, go to town and get some. Go to the merchants and mm -hmm. get some because apparently you've relied upon the merchants for everything else and that's very similar to what's going on in Sardis. Right, right. Well, and we even see this in um, the modern church and it was a story that I, I saw this week at the Christian Post which I thought was interesting. An interview with a popular uh, singer-songwriter, Keith Getty. He and his wife are from Northern Ireland and made some comments about uh, popular praise and worship music that has been a pet peeve of you and me for, for years. Not a fan. Yeah, uh, the so-called 7-Eleven songs, seven words repeated 11 times. Mm -hmm. 11,000 times. Yeah. He made some statements that I think are relevant to this conversation. Uh, he said that uh, he believes that this type of uh, praise and worship music that appeals to emotion rather than being doctrinally sound, scripturally based, is dangerous because he said it's leaving this generation coming up listening to this music ill-equipped to understand or defend the Christian faith. Yeah. And he's right because if your faith is based on how you feel on any given day, if a day, because all of us have days where we feel down, depressed, the enemy is attacking and oppressing mm -hmm. us, we might not even recognize it at first. I tend to not default to that setting, you know, checking my, my to make sure my armor is, is fully mm -hmm. button, buckled on. Um, you know, and that's something I have to work on. The enemy will, will look for those weak spots and attack those. And, uh, you know, being a guy, I think, well, I can fix this with, uh, you know, better sleep or, uh, you know, whatever. But if we depend on our emotions to guide our spiritual life, we will always go astray. Yeah. Because there's plenty of music out there that can lift you up and make you feel good that has nothing whatsoever to do with proper Christian doctrine. But those songs that are scripturally based, old, and not all of them are old hymns. I mean, our friend Pastor Casper McLeod writes mm -hmm. some awesome power pop mid '80s oh, guitar boy, bass. With, does he? Yeah, with with scripturally sound, scripturally based lyrics. Mm -hmm. But some of those old hymns, like "All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name," and you know, "There's Power in the Blood," mm -hmm. you know, things like that that help you to memorize scripture. You talk about the the oratorio with. You, you shared with me, yes, Elijah, that we, you shared with me on our trip down to Oklahoma City to uh, see our friends at Prophecy Watch. I so love that oratorio because it's all scripture. It's all scripture. And it helps you to understand how it relates to our lives. God is the same regardless of how we feel. I mean, there will be days where we feel like, I don't want to get out of bed today. But yeah. that doesn't mean God has changed. doesn't mean he's abandoned you. doesn't mean that uh, your faith is dead either. Mm. It just means... You know, you're having a down day. Pray, get in the word, and, you know, God will, his spirit will help you get out of it. The church at Sardis, and many in the church today, and I think that's what Keith Getty is pointing to here, they've been so numbed or drawn away by these things of the flesh that make them feel good that, that they don't even recognize that they're spiritually dead. Well, did you, I, and that's so true, but did you notice something else about the letter to Sardis? They don't have any kind of pressure. Yeah, yeah. There's no prophetess steering them away. There, there are no local uh, congregations like synagogues of Satan or anything like They're that. They're not being persecuted. They're not being persecuted. They have no pressure upon them. Another, yes, another reason that it's a representation of that 
uh, church of the late Middle Ages mm-hmm. and, and the church of the, uh, what do we call the Enlightenment period, mm-hmm. the beginning of the Enlightenment yeah. period almost, um, because the Roman Catholic Church at that time in the West was pretty dominant. So, yeah, it, uh, but, but as we pointed out through each of these periods of history, real church history is a lot more nuanced mm-hmm. and, and uh, so each of these churches, there, there are aspects of each of these churches still alive today. Amen. So, and I want to make yeah. sure that everybody understands it's not just the Roman Catholic Church. That's correct. Yes. Anytime you have a state church, mm-hmm. then you are in big trouble. Even a hierarchical church that's not necessarily a state church mm-hmm. because you've got church hierarchies in, here in the United States that don't have anything to do with the, the uh, government mm-hmm. of the United States. And yet uh, they dictate to the local congregations, mm-hmm. here's what you will teach, here's what you will not teach. So uh, yeah, you, you wind up getting into trouble there because every time you've got a hierarchy, you've got the opportunity for political gamesmanship to be mm-hmm. played. And you're seeing some denominations that were strong in the faith now being co-opted and brought over toward a, oh. uh, a very worldly approach to scripture. Oh, <laughs> well, those laws that Moses brought down for them, that was great for 3,500 years ago, but those are so outdated today. Oh, absolutely. But I want to make it clear that a theocracy isn't going to fix it either. No. Uh-uh. If you have a state sanctioned, state run religion, right, right. it will have no pressure upon it. That's true. That's true. So, yeah, you can go too far in either direction. Mm-hmm. And really, the model of the first century church, uh, the, more, the older house? I get, the more I think the house church movement really yeah. has got something going By for it. By the way, back yeah. to music, and then we'll take a break. Um, you and I talked with uh, uh, William Bennett? No, um, the Lutheran pastor. Robert Bennett. Robert Bennett. Yes. I always get the Bennetts mixed up. Yeah, pa- um, yeah. yeah William Bennett's a, you know, another guy. <laughs> but uh, Robert Bennett, and he was talking about how the old hymns, because they are scripturally based, mm-hmm. usually, sometimes they're all scripture, that they're exorcistic. Yes, and that was really interesting hearing that from a Lutheran theologian, because mm-hmm. Lutherans aren't really known for engaging in spiritual warfare. No, but he's not a zombie. He is totally awake, and it's yes. because he saw the spirit warfare close up when he was a missionary. Yeah, well, uh, it's East Missouri Synod, too, so that may yeah. have something to do with that. There. Probably does. <laughs> yeah. We need to take a break. We do. Well, we're talking about the Church of Sardis, and we will continue our conversation. We'll look at the seven stars and the seven spirits when Unraveling Revelation continues. NASA, Donald Trump, and a cosmic cover-up of end times proportions. Skywatch TV is proud to announce the largest giveaway of the year, the Project Wormwood Grand Giveaway. When you order Dr. Thomas Horn's new book, The Wormwood Prophecy, from the Skywatch TV store, you'll also receive on DVD the entire four-part Skywatch TV series on The Wormwood Prophecy featuring Dr. Thomas Horn and Derek and Sharon Gilbert. But we're just getting started. You'll also receive the never before released Best of Defender Publishing ebook collection on Data Disc, featuring 70 of the most information packed best selling books in Defender history. These full length works are in popular ebook formats so you can read them on EPUB, PDF, Kindle, and other handheld electronic devices. Give this collection as the ultimate gift to somebody you know this holiday season or take them with you wherever you go. Valued at over $700 all by itself. But that's not all. With the holidays just around the corner, now's your chance to save big and receive a massive collection of merchandise. Also included in the Wormwood Grand Giveaway is a gargantuan supply of brand new super quality overstock gift books, DVDs, audio sets, survival and organic living books to add to your library or to give away as gifts this holiday season. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of over $900. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. This is the largest giveaway of the year and will be available only while supplies last, so don't delay. The Project Wormwood Grand Giveaway, available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985. It's ground zero in a supernatural war that's lasted for millennia. Now, see it for yourself. Join Skywatch TV for a -a one-of-a-kind tour of Israel to places you'll never forget. Like mysterious Gilgal Rephaim, older than the pyramids, bigger than Stonehenge, and built to venerate the dead. 
Benias, sacred to the goat demon Pan. The altar of Joshua, where he declared that he and his house would serve the Lord. Bethel, where Jacob saw a stairway to heaven. And Jerusalem, which God has chosen for his resting place forever. Skywatch TV's Derek and Sharon Gilbert and special guest Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat lead you through the Holy Land from Mount Hermon to the Red Sea with teaching along the way. And as a special bonus, a four-day optional extension to Sardinia to see the ancient ziggurat of Monte de Cody, megalithic tombs of the giants, and the Tophet of Taros, where children were sacrificed to the dark god Baal Haman. Or if you want more time in Sardinia, join us for our separate eight-day tour of the mysterious island. Skywatch TV's 2020 Tour of Israel, October 12th through 25th, with optional tour extensions in Sardinia. For more information and to reserve your place, log on to LipkinTours.com. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are talking about the church at Sardis that had nearly all of them lacked the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Their their clothing was not pure as snow because they truly just did not have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. That's right. They Uh, probably did some great works. Sorry, works doesn't work. No, that's (laughs) true. That's true. If this was just about uh, feeding the poor, clothing the needy, and uh, caring for widows and orphans, that's all great. And we're commanded Mm -hmm. to do those things as Christians, but that's not the end in and of itself. Um, That is a means to an end, and the means is showing the love of Jesus Christ so that we can bring them into the kingdom of God. Amen. So, uh, again, verse 1 of Revelation 3, Jesus describes himself as him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, the question is, who are those spirits and stars? Now, the uh, stars, angels of the seven churches. The angels of the seven churches. But who are those seven spirits? Well, you know, we are, we are told in Zechariah that the Holy Spirit has seven, you might say, manifestations or seven jobs or seven titles. Mm-hmm. It's uh, very interesting because Zechariah 4, which is a prophetic chapter, um, Zechariah is given a vision of a golden lampstand. Starting right off the bat, you get exactly what he tells Sardis to do. Yeah. The angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it. So that would be very similar to the lampstand that Jesus talks about in Revelation, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. Some speculation. Are those olive trees the two witnesses of Revelation, perhaps? Or the two testaments. Or the two testaments. both. Yeah. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, and, and we just use Yahweh whenever we see the capital L-O-R-D. It's not a, ho- a sacred name type thing. It's just so that we know that, you know, God has a name, yeah. which he revealed to Moses. Because Lord, the actual original language behind the English word Lord varies. Mm-hmm. When it's all caps, it's yeah. always Yahweh. Yeah. So, yes. So, to distinguish it from the, uh, the Lord that uh, Zechariah was referring to the angel, this mm-hmm. is not the same Lord. Uh, this is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And I've heard that phrase, verse before. Mm-hmm. Says Yahweh of hosts, which basically means Yahweh of armies. Um, Who are you, O great mountain? That is fascinating. I love that. Oh, Zechariah yeah. four verse seven. That gets into veneration territory. Yes, great mountain was one of the chief, the main epithets or nicknames or titles of the chief god of the Sumerians, Enlil. Yes. Who in my research, well, not my research, but the research of scholars who've dug into Sumerian religion, Enlil was Dagon, was El, was Kronos, was Saturn, all the same entity under different names. So Enlil, not Enki. Not Enki. Because we hear about Enki all the time. Yes, no, this was Enlil. He was the chief of their pantheon until Marduk rose up, just like El was the chief of the Canaanite Mm -hmm. pantheon until Baal came along. So, who are you, O great mountain? 
before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And, and by the way, this is relevant to veneration because this entity, Saturn, Kronos, Enlil, El, Dagon, mm -hmm. we equate with the leader of the Watchers who descended to Mount Hermon and oh, yeah. created the Nephilim. Oh, yeah. So, by the way, verse 14, the two lampstands. Right. These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So again, who are the, the two anointed ones? Who that, are the two anointed ones? Two we, sons of new oil is the, other, the alternate Hebrew translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But... Um, it might be the two witnesses. Yeah. So verse, uh, skipping down to verse um, 10. For whoever despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall, she shall, shall see shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, of course, rebuilt the temple, the second temple. These seven are the eyes of Yahweh which range through the whole earth. Yes. So the seven spirits of God range through the whole earth and basically see all things. This is just re-emphasizing that God is omniscient and knows all things. He is omnipresent as mm -hmm. well. We see this later on in Revelation 5. We see, um, and I saw a lamb standing, lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Hmm. Just in case you didn't know. <laughs> but there's another chapter, in a, and I, I can't find it right now, so I apologize to you. Um, I, thought I, I thought it was Zechariah 4. But it actually lists the aspects. Oh, uh, that's in the Isaiah, ministries. and I'm going to find that in just a moment here. So, uh, yes, Isaiah talks about. I used to have those memorized, the seven spirits. Um, we also have in Revelation four from the front. Fr and I'll let you find that. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, storm god language, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So seven aspects to the spirits ministry mm. as well. The seven spirits of God are mentioned in Isaiah 11. And I used to have this mentioned. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, oh, gosh, yes. In yes. fact, this is in Isaiah and uh, uh, Elijah. Ah, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So exactly. Yes. So spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, counsel might, strength. knowledge, fear. Yep. So those are the seven. And, um, it is interesting, again, that uh, we see John knew his Old Testament. He did. But he was writing under the guidance of the Holy under Spirit. Under the guidance so no of the question, Holy Spirit. Yeah, no exactly. surprise. So we've got Sardis who don't seem to understand that, they, that the members of this congregation don't seem to understand. They've lost the good preaching mm -hmm. because he tells them, remember what you were taught. Another translation is, remember how you were taught. The, the lessons, what, what had to happen. In other words, that Christ gave his blood for you. He suffered, died, rose mm -hmm. again. These are the things you were taught. This is how it took place. There was a sacrifice. And you seem to somehow think now it all comes down to you and your works ministry. You've left the Lamb of God behind. Hmm. And it's interesting that he uses the phrase, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. This is not really a, re a reference to the rapture because we've, uh, the, the, Paul uses the phrase, he will come like a thief in the night. Actually. I think it can be, but it's not primarily. And I'll get to why I think it can be here in a minute. But I yep. think primarily it's referring back to well, the Sardis historically, they've had other nations come in and just take them over. Well, and like true. a thief in the night because they were asleep. Multiple times, multiple times. That was, uh, yeah, and it was so ridiculous because Sardis had wonderful natural defenses if they had just been awake and guarded the side that they... Exactly. No, I know they've attacked over that wall five times yeah, but before. They never They'll will. never do it but again. But you know, yeah. well, I think it was when uh, um, Alexander or one of them came through, they they just, look, we're going to die again. Let's just go down and give ourselves up. Yeah, yeah. yeah Alexander's um, reputation preceded him. I think that it is possible that one of the meanings of this is the rapture because all of these churches exist now. Mm-hmm. He's speaking to those churches that have become shells. Um, I, I spent a lot of my years on a farm. And you can have a silage container that's full of corn that's drying out. And you can go and check your, okay, is it drying? Because it shrinks as it dries. Mm -hmm. So you all have this crust. 
that builds up on the top. So if you look down from the top, you'll see, wow, look at all that corn that's in there, but it's actually shrunk down. Mm -hmm. If you actually try to rely upon that and you walk upon that shell, oh, yeah. you will fall down. There were men in our city who died yeah, because yeah. they would actually trust in that shell. Mm. Nuh -uh. You fall Don't down in it, you get buried and suffocated. Trust yeah. in your own works. Well, and that's why I think uh, this is not necessarily a rapture reference because it says, uh, Jesus says, you will not know at what hour I will come against you rather than come for you. Well, or if it's for you, it has, I, I've read a wonderful um, analysis of this by Ray Steadman, and he, mm -hmm. he says that the language there seems to imply that the thief, what's the thief come for? To he steal. comes to steal your best stuff. Right. So if he comes in to steal, it's that which actually has value mm -hmm. in your congregation. And that's those whose white robes are white as ah, snow. Okay, all right. I can that's see that. That's the only thing holding them together. Mm -hmm. That's the only pure, valuable part of that congregation. Right. Those the rest not, of it is all wood, hay, and stubble. Right. Yeah, those who've not soiled their garments. Mm -hmm. But he says that even those who have, if they remember what they've been taught and repent, they too will have clo will be clothed in white garments. Exactly. That's the thing. He yes. says there's still hope for you. Yes. So that we can say that to this generation, that those churches that are living that way, and honestly, there are a lot of churches, and it's not necessarily the old guard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I have seen many churches that at one time were the first whatever in town, and they are just a tiny sliver of people yep. who go there. They're mainly old, and the church is long gone dead. Mm -hmm. There are other churches today that are filled with tens of thousands of people who don't know Christ as Savior. Right. They're could, there just having a good time. And that gets back to what you know Keith Getty was talking about in that recent interview. Mm -hmm. he, and he's right. There are many people who are there because it makes them feel good, but not because they've been broken and realize that we are all in need of salvation, which comes only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Exactly. What we have forgotten is that we are part of a very long war. And one of the prizes in that war is mankind. Hmm. Jesus Christ gave himself so that we could be redeemed. And we need only trust in that. And that shield of faith, that belief in him, that's what holds back those slings and arrows of the enemy because we stand on a battlefield and Sardis clearly forgot that. Yeah. Well, they're sleeping on a battlefield. Yeah, clearly. And that was, uh, sadly, that was their history. And Jesus drew on that to make his point, his theological point. Well, next week, we'll begin our discussion of the Church of Philadelphia and how that may be relevant today. Mm -hmm. And we want to remind you that over the Christmas break, we will not have Unraveling Revelation or Sci Friday. So there'll be a couple of weeks where there's no new program. So we may start Philadelphia and wrap it up after the first of the year. Sounds good. Well, we thank you for watching. This is Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV.